Cool. So my name is Matt Turner. Um, I was going to sort of walk out and say hola or something and promise it's the last Spanish I'm going to say until Dos Cerveza this evening. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not a celebrity. I don't have any Game of Thrones references. Uh, I'm not going to be hacking any mainframes. I'm not going to be making any music. Um, my slides are actually even black and white, but hopefully um, show you something interesting and kind of practical and practically useful today. And it is, I think, a good segue from, from the talk before. Uh, so I'm a software engineer. I'm at a startup called Tetrate, who you probably haven't heard of. Um, and we do service mesh stuff. Um, specifically, we work on a service mesh called Istio. I just need to get that out there for the kind of bias thing. Um, Istio is the service mesh that I'm going to demo in this talk. Uh, it's Istio's features that I talk about, but there, there are others. Um, I will talk about the sort of general category of, of solutions that we can, that we can solve, um, but Istio is the one that I know best. Um, prior to that, I've been doing a bit of DevOps. I was a Kubernetes consultant in London and uh, did DevOps at Skyscanner. If anybody came here on a, on a cheap flight, that was Kubernetes there was, was yeah, um, my department as well. So wherever the, um, uh, the transcriber is, you are doing a fantastic job. And if I like, if I speak too fast, just wave at me. But yeah, no, seriously. Come on. Focus. Right. Um, so I'm going to give a bit of context and look at how we got here. Uh, and this is the back-end track. Um, and there's been some super interesting talks on, on programming languages and whatever. And it's really nice that it's an actual back-end track. I spend so much time talking about, um, you know, normally when I hear the word back-end, I'm actually talking to infrastructure people about DevOps. So it's nice to have a bit of a change. But also, I'll give a bit of context. Um, we'll maybe talk about what a, the hell a service mesh is anyway. Um, we'll see a demo, but given, given the butterfingers, um, and then we'll look at what a like, the service mesh can actually do for you. Um, we'll go through some common counter arguments uh, against deploying one, and then maybe I'll actually try to answer the question, uh, do you actually need a service mesh? Right, now I get it. Where's, uh, where's the MC? He can literally do that. Um, so as a pop quiz, um, who's heard of a service mesh? Okay. Who thinks it's like a mesh networking, or an IoT, or a cell network thing? OK, good, because that's not what we're talking about. Um, anybody heard of like Istio, Linkerd, Conduit technology specifically? OK, cool. Um, so nobody sort of understands enough to decide for themselves whether they need one. I can't go to the bar. Right. Um, good, I haven't completely misjudged that. Um, so whose back end is currently like a monolith, like one node, Rails, PHP? thing, maybe a three-tier app. OK, so everybody's on microservices. SOA, yeah, yeah. I know we're all hungover, but OK, good. I'm going to assume that. This is for, this is for when you get there. Um, so I mean, the general idea, right, is a user request hits the front end, and then that one service calls some more over a network, right, and there's a sort of scatter-gather calls, bounce around the back end, uh, and then go back to the user. Cool. Um, and who, who sort of ends up doing ops or DevOps? by name or by, by being the only person prepared to pick that up. Yeah, cool. Um, who deploys their stack manually? Who actually like, does deployments into prob by hand? OK, so everybody's getting, getting more automated, Ansible, Terraform. Yeah, cool. OK, um, so who's, who is in a public cloud? OK, and anybody on Kubernetes? We love Kubernetes. Kubernetes is great. Cool. Um, neither of those last two is actually necessary. Uh, I'll, I'll cover some of that. Uh, the demo will be in Cube on a, on a cloud because it's super easy. Um, but I'll go over why like, that infrastructure isn't necessary. And if anything, a service mesh, although you might have heard of it as like the next step after Terraform and then after Kubernetes, actually, I think a service mesh can be a great way into the cloud and into Kubernetes. It, it's something you can retrofit to a system to give you all the benefits I'm going to talk about, including a lot of observability before you make that leap. Uh, if anything. Right. So how did we get here? Um, how did we get to, to talking about this stuff? What's, what's the kind of state of play? Well, there's two, there's, there's two changes I want to talk about that have happened over time. Um, the first is that we got here through, through sort of in-process libraries. Uh, I can't draw. But what this is trying to tell you is that computers suck. Um, like at any point, your network, which is this, this gray pipe, right? That's obvious, could be on fire. 
Um, your operating system could be on fire. Maybe that's the gray box, the VM, your service, the whole data center, which is the other box, obviously, um, could just be completely on fire. And in sort of you know, 1999, I think, we gave up trying to make computers reliable. Google refused to buy server class hardware. Uh, and they just built everything using commodity machines, and they expected them to fail. And like Charity says, most of the time, something is broken, and you just don't know about it. Um, so we stopped trying to make these machines bigger and bigger. We stopped trying to make them more reliable. We just bought more of them and bought more fire extinguishers. Um, so you know, what do you do if I'm showing two services here, but maybe you've got 1,000 microservices? And what do you do if a bunch of that stuff on the back end is on fire? What do you do if a bunch of those calls fail? Right, user hits one service, and you hope that every service does a job. So there's this scatter gather propagation of calls and replies. Maybe there's a thousand of them. If one of them fails, like you hope it's necessary, so something's gone wrong there, right? There's some service we were trying to provide to the user that we can't. Um, so what do we do? Well, often that user would just get a 500. It's shitty, but it's it's common. Um, better systems, you know, tried those calls, maybe timed them out if the service they were talking to wedged, maybe retried them through a circuit breaker if that service failed repeatedly. Um, and there were a bunch of, I'm sure there was a bunch of in-house libraries that people made for this, but there were also some, some open source efforts. Um, so Hysterix from uh, Netflix, right? Finnegal from Twitter, um, and gRPC. I know the next talk's on gRPC, so I won't, uh, I won't talk too much about that. Um, but these, these libraries are all communication libraries, like sort of socket abstraction libraries, and they give you some resiliency. They give you some timeouts and some retries. Um, but they're all in process. Finnegal and Hystrix are both JVM only. Um, that's why um, Finnegal is even Scala, right? So it's got some, it's like super, super fast on the main path, but it has this crazy, crazy tail latency. Um, so you have to be on the JVM. These things have to be in process. There has to be a copy of them in every microservice. Um, so they, they got us to a certain point, but I'm going to show that I think we can do a little bit better. Um, but this whole idea of dele delegating communication isn't unique, right? We use we use an Ethernet stack. We use an IP stack. Does anybody use PubNub or Pusher or something to do? That's maybe more of a front-end question. To do like yeah, to do web sockets, um, sort of real-time updates for web pages. So they handle they handle the web socket connections because web sockets horrible. But they'll establish it and reconnect it and stuff. Um, and of course, there wouldn't just be one back-end service. There'd be there'd be lots for load for resiliency. So you need to load balance between them. Um, gRPC, the gRPC library gives you a lot of that load balancing functionality. Um, that we'll look at, but other, other libraries don't, so you tend to just stick a reverse proxy in front, right? A low bias, an F5 if, you, if you're actually sort of at real scale. And we also got here through declarative infrastructure. This is the big point of this, this slide full of logos. They're reasonably carefully chosen. Um, the big point is that all of these systems here are not an imperative systems. They're not tools for making your, like your one-shot bash scripts faster to type. They are systems where you declare the desired state of the world and you, you try to get there. Um, so first of all, I'd sort of argue that we got our servers under control with the likes of Ansible and Puppet and Chef. Um, this made things automated, right? It, it was faster than typing the commands in to set something up. It made it repeatable. Um, and importantly, it's declarative. Let's not talk about Ansible, but Puppet and Chef, declarative, declarative system. Um, and then they weren't even machines anymore, right? They were VMs, and they weren't even in our data center. They were in somebody else's data center. Um, so Google Cloud is your AWS with CloudFormation and whatever. You can declare the state of the VMs and the load balancers and the databases that you would like, uh, you know, your VLANs, your DNS entries, the whole lot. And then we kind of abstracted it, and we standardized it. So Terraform is a, an abstraction over um, sort of all the cloud providers. It, doesn't hide the details, but at least brings everything into, into control in one place. So I can say I want a VM in Azure, and I want a DNS entry in Cloudflare, and I want a database in Google, and I want a key on that GitHub account. right? And it's all just one, uh, one YAML declaration of what the world should look like. Um, containers make compute all look the same, really, no matter where you are. Uh, Docker allows you to declare what that looks like on one machine, and then Kubernetes runs it across multiple machines. Um, but in all of this, the network, that, that communication between those services is still kind of a dumb pipe, right? You still address things ultimately by IP addresses. Um, the cloud providers give you networks between these VMs that they, they will tell you are unreliable. So yeah, and there's, there's, I think Amazon maybe offers a bit of an SLO, but it's obviously it's not 100%. Um, so your services have to deal with that themselves. They maybe use those libraries that we saw previously. Um, 
you know, Kubernetes will bring back a container that crashes, it'll bring back a container on a node that crashes, but if the network between two pods fails, like, it just, the call is lost. So my assertion to you is that a service mesh is the best of both of these things. Um, it is both uh, free resiliency and, and some other characteristics we're going to look at. It, it is a better networking system, a better service-to-service -service call mechanism, but it's also declarative and automatable. Um, so a service mesh, will, we'll get into the details, but a service mesh um, takes that network between your microservices, be they Kubernetes pods or actually really be they uh, Unix processes in VMs, uh, and it adds advanced traffic routing to them. Um, it gives you, I've said telemetry, I'm gonna get told off. Okay, it gives you observability in the holistic sense. Um, they give you a whole lot of runtime policy enforcement, uh, and they give you security, both sort of service to surface um, whitelist and blacklist access controls, uh, and mutual TLS. So we'll, we'll look at all of that stuff. Um, so what is a service mesh? The easiest way to start is like how one is actually built. So, oh, okay, now I have a slide on, I have a bit of a wave of hand slide on how service meshes democratize Google's advantage, um, which is basically to say that people like Google and Twitter and Amazon, they get to move real fast and they get to, from the user's point of view, be almost 100% up because uh, they have this incredible platform. They have this, this set of internal tools. Google's especially is like super interesting. Um, on the left is the sort of Google stack from, from Borg, which is the thing that runs all of the workloads through Spanner, which is this like crazy cap theorem beating, you know, globally consistent database. And then there's a bunch of other stuff, Blaze is a build tool and whatever. Um, all of these systems are known about. There are white papers on them and how they work, um, but they are, they are internal to Google. They're all coupled to each other. They all use real secret source, like the big um, globally distributed Google file system, so they can't really be teased apart. Um, they can't be open sourced. So kind of one at a time, they're, being, uh, they're all being rebuilt at open source and released to the public. So Kubernetes is, is famous now. I'm wearing the T-shirt, right? That's a kind of a re-implementation of Borg. Um, Prometheus mirrors some internal monitoring system, et cetera, et cetera. So um, up at the top of this list, we see the wonderfully named GFE and ESF. Uh, these are Google internal low balancing proxy communication systems. Uh, their, their closest mirror is in something called Envoy, which is, uh, if you've heard of it, it's like a layer, it's an HTTP proxy, right? It's a layer seven reverse proxy. It's not a web server, like it basically does everything that a web server would do. Nginx is a web server, right? It serves files off disk, and with a bit of config, you can have it reverse proxy things. Um, Envoy does the reverse proxying, does everything but serve files off disk. Um, so it's an HTTP reverse proxy, and it's the building block of the Istio service mesh that we're, that we're going to see. So how do, they, how do they actually work, right? In really simple terms, you've got two services, A and B, and what you do is you stick a proxy in front of them. This, this pink box is actually the, the Envoy logo. Um, but you stick an, an HTTP proxy alongside each one of these services. Um, and this is called a sidecar, right? So maybe this gray box is a Kubernetes pod. For anybody who knows like, how that works, it's, it's a container, basically. It's, it's a network namespace and a process ID namespace and whatever. Or maybe these services are just Unix services and the gray boxes are just VMs that you've deployed them onto. But the, the point is that you, you get an HTTP proxy next to each one. Um, it's a separate Unix process. It requires absolutely no modification of the service. Uh, the service doesn't even know it exists. So you set up IP tables rules, basically, to intercept all of the traffic coming in and out of that service uh, and send it to the proxy. And then the, the proxy does communication kind of on behalf of the service. Um, so it's in the request path. That means it can see the whole request. It sees every request. It sees the whole body of every request. Um, and as I say, the service doesn't need to know it's there. The service doesn't need to make some side channel call to be like, hey, I just tried to make a, a call. Can you check with the other guy that it got there? And then maybe we can talk about collaborating on a retry. Like, that, that doesn't happen. It's literally on the request path. Um, and as a result, it can also see the, the actual number of bytes that have gone through, the actual time taken from the point of view of the calling service, uh, that kind of thing. And if this proxy, I started off calling it an HTTP proxy. If it's, if it's a layer seven proxy, if it's a proxy, 
that not only understands the sort of source and destination IP address of the packets that go past, but also um, says, oh, this is HTTP, and I know how to pass the headers on that. I can see what the host header is. I can see what the user agent header is. Or this is MySQL. I understand that this is an insert request aimed at that table. Um, then you can do a whole load more stuff. Um, to be pedantic, this is a service mesh. This is a mesh of services. This is some services that are meshed together um, by a slightly smarter network, right, which is this sort of layer seven proxy. Um, but these proxies need configuring. So this, no, there would be nothing to stop you building this by hand, right? You, you've probably done something. If you squinted it, you've probably done something kind of similar with Nginx. Set up all the IP tables rules to intercept the traffic and then write config files for each one of these things and, and deploy them with Ansible or whatever. It, it gets super tedious. Um, but technically, this is a service mesh. This is all you need to get kind of most of the benefits that I'm talking about. Um, but it's useful to have a whole load more tooling around it. So what we normally refer to it's the slightly bigger version of this picture. So again, this is, this is Istio. And all this is is that service mesh, that, that data plane, right, where your services live and they exchange data with each other, plus a control plane. And we won't go into the details, but Istio has sort of three main control plane components. They have kooky names. Of course, they do. Um, but I mean, importantly, I think I've got a laser. I've got a laser. Importantly, there is an API in the front of all of them, right? So I can talk to this API and I can tell the control plane to go configure each of these proxies. And the two are shown here. There could be 10,000. Um, so we can, we can get consistent policy and configuration across all of these proxies which are communicating on behalf of the services. Um, and this API, of course, not only can you, can you curl it, but it also, takes declarative, it also takes YAML files, basically. It also takes declarations of what this network should look like, what its topology should be, what its policy enforcement should be. So, do you need a service mesh? Well, we'll look at what one actually does, like what it, what it gives to you. Um, so I showed how they work first, which hopefully makes the rest of this make a bit more sense. I think you need that kind of mental model of, you know, I'm trying to send JSON over HTTP to that other guy, um, but a little agent that is HTTP JSON aware, you know, picks it up and has a look at it and goes, okay, I see you try to fling these bytes at that IP address, but um, actually I can do a much better job, I understand the HTTP headers, I understand like what service you were actually trying to call, I understand what content type you wanted back, I understand that this is like a chunked streaming request or something. Um, so this is a statement from one of the service mesh vendors. Uh, a service mesh is a dedicated infrastructure layer for making service-to-service -service communication fast, safe, and reliable. We could probably all buy that, right? Google's definition, and as I say, they're the, they're the sort of, Istio is a community effort. Um, a bunch of other companies are involved. Shout out to the IBM people. Um, but uh, Google's been heavily behind it as well. This, this quote is from them. And this says that a service mesh is a, I don't even have it, a service mesh is a transparent, language independent way to flexibly and easily automate application network functions. Sorry, transcriber. Um, I rattled through that because it's, it's quite a mouthful, so let's sort of, let's, let's pull it apart a bit. A service mesh provides a transparent and language independent way. So take a service, add a proxy, add IP tables rules to take all of the traffic going in and out of that service to the proxy, like, like the TSOX proxy you would be using for, for Tor, right? Um, so that service doesn't need to know. It's transparent. That service can be written in any language, right? That could be Bash. That could be um, Pony, right? That could be really any end of the spectrum you want. Um, and it doesn't need to have libraries for, that know how to do retries and know how to do exponential backoff. If what well, there are certain, certain types of communication where there's actually explicit side channel communication, like explicitly applying back pressure, that requires a standardized wire protocol. You know, you know your language would need, you would need, not only would you need a library for your language, it would have to be in cahoots with all the other libraries for all the other languages that all your other services are written in. Um, all of that goes away when you take this out of, out of service. So it's language independent in that respect. Um, easily. Well, if that gray box is a Kubernetes pod, and that's the demo we're going to be seeing, this, this so-called sidecar, this proxy, can be automatically put in there. So your developer makes their service, their, their contract for deployment is a container, so what they produce is a container image, and they write a Kubernetes YAML that says, hey, Kubernetes, run this container image at this version a thousand times across the cluster. 
All they have to write is that, and then the Istio control plane will say, ah, oh, I see you're trying to deploy a service, I'm gonna add a sidecar. And even the, even the, the sort of DevOps person who developed and operates the software doesn't have to know about that. Um, if you're trying to retrofit this to VMs in a data center, then you do obviously have to do some work. Uh, it's automated. So here is a Kubernetes configuration file. Right? It's YAML, as you can see. Um, it's declarative. This one is declaring a uh, rate-limiting quota um, for a service. So what have we got? This, this is actually not applying. The configurations are, are very flexible. Um, so it comes in several parts. This is actually just decla this is declaring a bucket that's going to count a quota right, as it, as it happens. Um, so within, in every one second, there can be up to 5,000 calls, and I want you to, you know, I want you to make a bucket um, with this name uh, in, you know, in memory. It's a memory quota, and I want you to make a bucket that can count up to 5,000 and then say, I'm full, stop. And then what you actually do is you say, okay, that service, like calls to that service from these other two services, they, they add to that bucket, right? And, and so does this completely unrelated thing if you want to do that. That's how flexible it is. Um, but then the, all of these things that are wired into this bucket you know, contribute to its count, and when the bucket hits 5,000 in a second, like, they all stop. So that was a longer explanation than I should have given. I should have picked a simpler example. But it's automatic. I can declare this. I can write a file, and I can automate it, right? I can even go full GitOps. I can have this file in a Git repo, I can have Spinnaker or Weeflux like, to deploy changes to it automatically on every push. Um, so it's, it's as automatable as, as you want. The, the Istio system certainly doesn't get in the way of any CI, CD, or like, GitOps workflow you might want to use. Which one? And it's, fle it's flexible. Um, so this is another type of rule. What this actually does is this does a bit of split routing. Um, so this says that I am under, um, when you're trying to hit the reviews service, which is part of the demo we're going to see, so I've got a, I've got a service, a microservice called reviews. Um, when you're trying to hit that, uh, as in when the HTTP, I don't care what the IP address is that you've put on the wire in these packets, when the HTTP host header says, I'm trying to get to reviews, I want you to pick this thing up, and I want you to, okay, you're expecting it to be HTTP, and I want you to look in the headers. Um, and when the end user header is JSON, then you're going to go to reviews, and you're, but you're going to go to just version two, because maybe we've got two deployed at once. Maybe we're doing like an A-B test, a canary test. Um, otherwise, fall through and go to, oh, actually go to V3. OK, we're pinning JSON back to V2. This is a fine example of how flexible it is. Like, why are we matching on end users? Why JSON? Why is JSON pinned to an old version? I don't know. I don't really care. Um, it's super, super flexible, and you can, you can program up. It's just an infrastructure layer, right? You can program up any rules that make sense uh, for you. And then we get to application network functions, which is a kind of a loose term. Um, I don't want to get too philosophical. I promise some sort of practical information. There will be a failing, failing demo. Um, but imagine you had an overlay network, right, that is at layer seven. Imagine that instead of connecting all of your containers together at layer three with IP and using IP addresses to, to address them, um, you just use layer seven. So Every time one service wants to call another, it just throws its packets at 127.0.0.1. It doesn't matter. It'll still get picked up by these IP tables rules. And then the, the address, the actual place that that call gets to, is taken from the, the HTTP host header. Right? So say we've got uh, a user service deployed. It's, we've got v1 deployed, we've got v2 deployed, and we've got like a testing mock because users contains PII, and we have to be really careful like, who it answers calls to. So we've got three microservices, three DNS names, users v1, users v2, users mock. So any request, and they're all just going anywhere, right? Loop back, 8888, it doesn't matter. Any request whose HTTP header says host users just gets users v1. Unless they've set the header X testing, because you're deploying in staging or something, and you, you want to be, um, you're the test version of a consumer of users, so you want to integration test against the new users. If you've got that H, so you don't need a different port, right? You don't need to look up a different DNS name. You don't need, you don't need to know that you're, you've got to talk to the staging cluster. All you do is you say, hey, I'm getting for host users, um, but I've got this environment variable that's caused me to set the X testing flag on every HTTP request I make. For service mesh, 
is a kind of an application aware network, and it can send that to users v2. Um, and it, but it doesn't even have to be based on what's on the wire. So if, if my service is asking for uh, the user's host, but I've told Istio, well, hey, if we're in Kubernetes, right? So if the pod is in a, the namespace called staging, uh, you need to take, you need to route the call to the to the to the mock user service. So this, all the service is emitting is, hey, I want host users on some random IP address. It doesn't really doesn't matter what. Um, and Istio is saying, right, fine. You've had, you know, you don't even know you're in testing. You have absolutely no modification. You're testing as close to prod as you can. Um, but if the pod is in a namespace called staging, I'm going to do something different with your traffic. Right. But I, I can't go wrong because I've recorded it. Right? So there we go. Um, I think I do have a Game of Thrones reference. I really apologize. I miss you. I forgot. Um, where's my terminal? Yeah, have I still got any internet? Yeah. OK, can everybody read that? Wave your hand if you can't read it. Cool. Uh, so I've got a few. I have, I have written this into shell scripts, admittedly. Uh, and we're over scanning as well. I don't know if you can fiddle with the VGA cable. Oh, let me resize the window. Black on black. It's black on black. There we go. OK, right. Um, so I'm going to show you a demo in Kubernetes on GCP, on, so on GKE, which is Google's hosted Kubernetes. This just makes it easier. Um, we'd be here forever trying to do it any other way. Um, but it does work. So all I've done so far, because this takes a while, is I've brought up a Kubernetes container, a nice shiny new version on GKE. I've called it Full Stack Fest. Um, and we can see that, indeed, we have three Kubernetes worker nodes. I've downloaded Istio. Um, there's a nice link for it. You don't have to run this if you're more security conscious than I am. Uh, and I think I've installed um, Helm into the Kubernetes cluster. So Helm is like a package manager for Kubernetes. It just lets us send uh, definitions of lots and lots of pods and services all at once to Kubernetes. It's just a convenient package manager. And a, a few things we're going to use are packaged in, in Helm packages. Uh, it's there. Cool. OK. So we're going to install Istio. So this is using the Helm package manager that I told you about. Uh, this, this one does take a while, but I wanted to show you it's real. Um, so we're, we're telling Helm to call our, our installation Istio so we can find it later. We're sticking it in a Kubernetes namespace out of the way. We're just pointing it at a um, uh, Helm package that came in that Istio tarball that we downloaded. And I'm turning on, because of observability, I'm turning on a bunch of options that aren't, uh, aren't default, which is basically deploying. Um, I know logs, tracing, and metrics are just things, and they're not observability, but they are useful practical tools, right? So I'm basically turning on like a service that provides each one of those, um, which will just deploy those components. This is not the step to show when you're um, when your talk's running late. Can I get some more music, like, demo? Can I get some more? Maybe I'll skip ahead on the slides a bit. Can't remember where we're going next. Oh, yeah, OK. Um, so yeah, what this thing's going to give us when it comes up 
is it's going to give us observability, which I have incorrectly defined as logging, metrics, and tracing. <laughs> but this talk should, I'm not famous enough to go first. Talk should have been the other way around. Uh, but right, so you've got two proxies. They're intercepting all the traffic. They're actually talking to each other across the wire. Right, so at that point, every byte of every request is going through these proxies. So what can I do? I can automatically log the fact that that's happened, and I understand HTTP because I'm at layer seven, so I can log, well, hey, there was a request. It went for this host, this path. It was this method, and it got this return code after this number of milliseconds. Right, simple stuff, but that code, that boilerplate code, doesn't have to be in every service now, and I don't, my company doesn't have to have a cookie cutter for Go and Java and Ruby and Elixir, right, that's, that wires all of that up and sends it to the right place or any of those things. Um, I can just get it for free. The same with generating metrics, you know, histograms about those, those latencies, uh, and also sending distributing trace context to a tracing system. Um, if you remember the control plane I showed for Istio, actually all of those, all of those events first go to the control plane, uh, and then the control plane is configured, again, just by, by YAML files to, uh, for, its, for its log endpoints, basically. So I can write a YAML file that says, hey, control plane, you're gonna be getting metrics, and I want you to send, like, I want you to send them to a Prometheus server called Foo over there, and I also want you to send them to like a Graphite server called Bar. And if you want to add another logging backend to get the logs, then you just write another file and you submit it to the Istio control plane, and it just works. So that's that's super neat. Um, we can do traffic routing at layer seven because we have all of the information about what's going on at an application level. This lets us do. Um, okay, traffic mirroring, it lets me say there's production traffic going through and I also want to tee off a copy and also send it to this staging system so this is better than just replaying prod. I can also mirror the prod traffic into something else. Um, obviously, I can do traffic shifting, I can do load shedding, I can do A-B testing, but I can do it intelligently. I can say something's on fire and I think it's a query of doom. I think, I don't know, I think we're being attacked, right? So I think user agent curl 7.16 is actually not the desired user of my service. I think that's not friendly. So let's just like spin up a new service in this, in this DMZ and punt all the curl 716 stuff over there um, and see if everything else suddenly gets cold because I think all these requests coming from curl have like the worst formulated database query you possibly can, right? That's sort of exponential in time. So we can do all that kind of stuff. Um, as I say, you can address at layer seven, so the IP address is, is now irrelevant. You can look at any arbitrary combination of like HTTP or gRPC headers. Um, you can even do like transparent MySQL sharding just by saying, well, uh, you know, table names A to F are in this instance. So you just, you just ask for MySQL and you just get sharded like that. Um, and I don't want to steal the thunder of the next talk, but you can do protocol translation, which is super cool. So at my company, we're Greenfield. Um, all of our services talk gRPC and gRPC only because gRPC is great. Um, but some legacy things like web browsers want to talk JSON. So all we do is we send another configuration file to Istio and we say, right, if you're the proxy sat in front of the service called front end, then I want you to open up, you know, we're listening on port 35, whatever it is for gRPC, I want you to open up port 80, and what I want you to do is translate incoming JSON to gRPC, send it to the gRPC port, and then anything that comes out, I want you to translate back to JSON. Uh, and Envoy can do that transparently, and it can be configured by the Istio control plane. Let's see if we've got a, yeah, we've got an Istio install. Cool, so Helm basically gave us a big long list of all the things it made. If you're familiar with Kubernetes, this will make sense. If you're not, wave my hands. Um, and then the last thing we did was to actually put a label on, on the default namespace in Kubernetes to say, hey, Istio, I want you to, to do that in automatic injection of the sidecars, because this is maybe a little risky. Um, this, is, this is something, Istio was released at version 0.1, and it had the quality you would expect of a 0.1 release. And everybody said it caused problems, and they all got very angry. Um, so it, Istio now has a bad reputation. I think, frankly, it was, you know, it did what it said on the tin at 0.1. Um, but, but now things like this are kind of opt-in, so we have to just stick a label on that namespace. But this is, this is great for incremental adoption, right? Because you can go turn it on in a testing namespace, in a staging namespace. You can roll it out gradually. Um, and not every, I should say that not, like, 
if one service is talking to another, they don't both need that envoy, right? The calling service will get all the advantages of, oh, that was a 500, let me retry it. Um, the callee will get uh, the advantages of, of rate limits being forced automatically. But if, if one side or the other doesn't have it, then you just, you just don't get those advantages because you're still just talking HTTP. As long as you're not doing protocol translation or anything crazy, um, you won't get those advantages. Okay, so we're gonna deploy a sample application. That's a really simple uh, kubectl apply up here of, of a sample that comes with Istio. Uh, and you can now see, okay, we've got some Kubernetes pods, but when we first did it, they're in status init because Istio in actually injects an init container to, get to go set up all those IP tables rules um, within every pod's network namespace to intercept all the traffic. And you can now see we've got zero of two containers ready. Um, so let's look at, I don't know, this, this reviews pod, you would assume it's only got one container, right? So sure enough, I've got a container called reviews. It's, yeah. Uh, SEO examples, booking for reviews, version one, there we go. But it's also got another container called Istio proxy, and this, this is a container image that contains Envoy uh, and the configuration listener. Um, automatically injected, the YAML file that declared this did not contain this Istio proxy. Are they up? They're all up. Cool, where did I get to? Um, the one thing that those YAMLs don't do is actually expose book info to the outside world. Oh, thanks, pass map. Cheers. Um, the one thing that uh, those YAMLs didn't do is expose book info to the outside world because that's very environment specific. Um, so we make another couple of these YAML files that basically tells us to open port 80 right at the front edge of the network. Um, and then I do a whole bunch of like JSON mangling to uh, basically find the GCP load balancer that we've just opened the actual, the actual port on. So I've now got this gateway URL that I can talk to. There we go. So we just hit gateway URL on port 80, we asked for the product page, and we got an HTTP 200. So I assert that it's up. And to prove I'm not lying, On. I've got a video, don't make me. There we go. Uh, thanks, right? <laughs> it does work, and I'm not completely useless. Uh, so this is, this is uh, not a great example of modern web design, but it is a sample app giving reviews of books. Um, one thing to notice here is if I refresh it a bunch of times, um, you can see these reviews, they were previously nice red stars, they're now black ones. Okay, now it's lost them all together. Red stars again, black stars. Okay, it's lost them all together. This is classic round robin load balancing between, we actually have three versions of the, it's the ratings microservice that produces those stars. We have three versions deployed. One doesn't do anything. One is monochrome. The latest one is, is color. Uh, and, but there's one Kubernetes service, if you're familiar with that, one load balancer effectively pointing at all three, so we get like a really poor man's A-B test for free because we are just load balancing round robin in between them. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add intelligence to the network at layer seven. So we're gonna write a bunch of these uh, so-called destination rule configurations out and if we take a look at one of them, uh, so yeah, it's the review service that's producing those stars, and we're saying, hey, Istio, whenever you see a host editor rev reviews, um, because all the calling service does, as you saw, it's just asking for reviews, right? And it's getting a different piece of code every time. When you're looking for reviews, there's actually three versions of those out there, three subsets of that that I want you to know about. I'm gonna call them V1, 2, and 3, and you can identify them again. This is where the Kubernetes integration comes in. You don't even identify them by anything on the wire. I want you to look at the labels on the pod because I've labeled the pods version v1, v2, v3, but that's the only thing that differs between them. Um, so this is how to tell these, these subsets of this review service apart. And a few more rules to say, I see you've got some services that really exist. I don't like them because they're you know, mismatched versions. I'm gonna make some virtual services. Uh, so that when you ask for ratings, 
any, any request for host ratings is an HTTP, and I want you to route it to, to that V1 subset of the ratings that I told you about. So just the pods with the label V1 on them. And now, no stars, ever. And the only way you can tell that apart is by, is by the Kubernetes label. We've not changed the DNS name that this page is calling at. We're not, we've not changed the IP. We've not gone to a different port number. We've not shifted the whole, mirrored the whole thing in a staging environment. We're just, we've just added that intelligence to the network. So let's say, one last piece of YAML, we want Jason to access V2 because he's, I'm Jason and I'm testing it, right? So again, if you match this HTTP header called end user and it says Jason, you get V2. So I have applied that. Oh no. Disaster. Come on. V1, V1. I am Jason. Does anybody know what Jason's password is? It's like, smash the keyboard. V2. 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 V1. So that's pretty cool. A couple more things to show. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go find uh, the address. This is all just Kubernetes fiddling around to automate things. We're going to go find the uh, address of the Jaeger distributed tracing system. We're going to forward the ports locally so we can get at it. Uh, so yeah, OK, the product page, that which is that front page. That whole time, even though I wasn't looking at it, Istio has been observing. I guess that's when I first brought it up. And then I chatted for a bit. And then I hear some more traces. So Istio has just been gathering those traces sending them off to Jaeger. There is, like, this code is open source. Trust me, there is no instrumentation code in any of these microservices. And yet, distributed traces. Same thing with dashboards. We asked it to deploy a Grafana. Everything is wired up automatically. Uh, So I can forward it and go to the Grafana instance. And I get, so this is mesh wide. These numbers aren't quite right, but other than that, I get mesh wide. You know, I haven't touched anything for a while, so I'm getting 0.7 ops a second, but I get mesh wide information uh, on what's going on. So this is like network observability. And then I can say for a particular service, maybe I want uh, reviews. So this is a classic dashboard, and this came, uh, I haven't curated this, obviously I, I could, but this has come out of the box. Uh, Istio does this for every service, I just have to pick it. I've got your classic red metrics, right? Requests, uh, error rate, duration, so P50, P95, P99. Um, request volumes, this was obviously when I was spamming refresh. Uh, I can say, almost like the wrong service, if I look at reviews, if I go to ratings, I can see that ratings has been called by reviews version, is calling reviews version two and reviews version three, because we did the JSON thing, right? Um, uh, reviews version two, I obviously called a bunch of times when I was logged in as JSON, and I obviously, oh, I never called v3. Don't actually know where the line for v1 was. I guess it's fallen off the end of this time series. But this is, you can create these, of course, but this is automatic. This is out of the box for every service that you strap this thing to, and you get real inline latency, you get real success rates, and these aren't like, did my TCP connection get a reset, this is, was it a, a non-2 or 300 HTTP, because I understand it at that level. Uh, I'm a bit out of time, so I will try to fire through the next lots. Yeah, so we can do that. Um, you can manage that traffic, so whereas this is more sort of policy for like every time I request foo, I either get, uh, you know, 80% chance I get the old version, 20% chance I get the new version, that's kind of static. This stuff is all dynamic, so I can throw circuit breakers for services that go wrong in real time. Uh, I, can, I can transparently add deadlines, right? So service calls another one and just waits forever. But Envoy will say, oh, well, that service didn't get back to you in a second. I'm just going to return you a 500 like that guy should have done, because he's obviously completely wedged. 
and I'm just going to retry and send you to another one, or I'm going to give you a cached value or a default or something. Um, as I say, we can enforce rate limits, and again, that's moving window, that's, that's, that's real time. We can inject faults. Uh, we, can, we can tell Istio that service A is, is too perfect, right? It hasn't spent its error budget, if you've read the SRE book. But actually, so it's not testing, it's downstream services, right? This is, you're meant to be testing in prod, and somebody wrote service A with like 100% uptime, how dare they? So I just want the proxy to pretend that it fails occasionally, just to check that if it ever does, service B can deal with it. Um, and we can do security, so we can do Access control lists um, based on an RBAC system. So I might put service A and service B in a role saying these are high security services. And then I give that role permission to talk to the user's database, which contains personally identifiable information. Nothing, no other service gets to talk to that, right? They can try, they can know where it is, they can know where it exists, they can fling packets at it. And you don't need like an old sort of concentric circles firewall system with DMZs. We just, the proxy just says, don't like you, you know, based on your Kubernetes label, based on whatever, based on the user agent header you've got, just going to drop your request on the floor. Um, okay, let me speed up. But I have an edge proxy. Yep, Istio can do that too. Um, we deploy more envoys as, as, as that edge layer that I was talking about, that ingress proxy. That's the thing we gave the instructions to, to open port 80, because it's sat behind a, cli um, a cloud load balancer. That's the thing facing the, the internet. So whatever your edge proxy does, um, in terms of host and path-based routing, you know, this is your classic Nginx reverse proxy uh, Istio can do, except it's all configured via that same API, that same mesh API with the same file format. Um, because it's part of the Istio system, you know, trace contexts and logs and metrics start there if you use Istio as your edge proxy. Um, so you should do that. Um, I have an API gateway. Okay, so Istio can do the rate limiting. Istio can do access control in terms of RBAC, right? As in, um, user doesn't come in with an authorization header, so they're not signed in, means they can't talk to any services except the home page service. We can do that. Uh, it can do JWT validation today if you give it a, whatever it's called, a JWKS, a Java Web Token Key Set. Um, so if, you, if you've got OAuth authentication on your API, Istio can actually enforce that today. Um, it can't do the OIDC authorization flow dance yet. So it can't single sign on, it can't redirect users to a single sign on page and then get them a, like a session cookie yet, but there is a PR out for it. So the API gateway still has some, the traditional API gateway still has some functions. Obviously some of them have advanced sort of bot blocking uh, and those kind, of, those kind of functions which Istio doesn't, doesn't really attempt to re-replicate. It's more of a networking layer. So you might still need an API gateway depending on what you're using it for. Uh, if you've got a CDN, you should keep it, right? The rate limiting in Istio works, but it's, it's only going to sort of trim 6,000 requests to 5,000. It's not going to drop you two orders of magnitude if you're being attacked. Um, and obviously, for latency and for whatever reasons, you should be pushing caches and, at, and assets to a CDN at scale. Like, it's not designed to, um, to replace that. And a lot of DOS, you know, a lot of really brutal, like, DOS protection is just blacklisting whole, whole ranges of IPs. If you try to pass every packet and understand the HTTP headers, you're just, you're just gonna kill yourself, right? Um, and Cloudflare and Akamai have very good APIs. You can definitely bring them into this realm of control with a tool like Terraform. Um, you have a WAF. Yeah, you probably wanna keep that too. Istio does this service-to-service -service access controls. Um, it, does, it will set mutual TLS up between the proxies, so everything's encrypted on the wire. Identity is verified on both sides, um, but it doesn't do, you know, it, although it does see the body of the HTTP request, although it does parse it, it doesn't recognize cross-site scripting attacks. It doesn't recognize SQL injection attacks. It doesn't do those classic WAF things yet. There's no reason it couldn't, and there is a PR out, or there's some work happening at least, to make a, a mod security plugin for Istio. So you'll say, hey, Istio, turn on mod security, and then suddenly Envoy will uh, wrote everything through a, through a copy of mod security to do exactly that. But it doesn't do it yet. So keep, keep your WAF, plus defense in depth. Uh, I have an APM system. Observability, well, logs, metrics, and traces, yes. Multiple arbitrary backends, as in I'm generating logs, and I want them going to this Elasticsearch and that CloudWatch and whatever, fine. Obviously, what it does, it's a network. What it doesn't do is that deep insight into the JVM or the .NET CLR through, through an agent. Um, there is work going on to integrate uh, the Apache Skywalking APM 
and have the Skywalking JVM agent send its observability data to the Istio control plane, the same as the proxy does, so that then you just say, right, uh, here's an Elasticsearch config, or logs that you get and want to go to this Elasticsearch cluster, and Istio will take care of routing both all the network information and Skywalking's information. But again, work in progress. Uh, you have an ESB. Yep, we do retries. We do flexible surface discovery, you know, late binding, re rerouting things. Um, if you're using your ESB as a pub sub broadcast system, like weird topologies, again, not really possible to set that up now. So, I appreciate we are eating into coffee time. Do you need a service mesh? I have to say something. Um, I think it depends on your circumstances, really. Um, I think it's something you should be aiming for. I hope I've convinced you of the value of the ease of use of the, the way this thing can move on after the over the next couple of years and all the extra functionality we can add. Um, I certainly wouldn't start building in process, you know, network resiliency now. I'm not saying don't add a logging library to a new service, but you don't need to. You could deploy the mesh. It might just be quicker to add a logging library. But re no, do bear that in the back of your mind. Um, you, of course, do need microservices. Like, this isn't going to help you much if you're one PHP monolith. Um, but those microservices can be on VMs. They can be in a data center. They, they don't need to be in Kubernetes. Like, Istio has comprehensive documentation on how to retrofit this stuff. You just need to um, do a lot of the networking yourself. Uh, and it can, it can enable hybrid and multi-cloud scenarios really well, which is why I said at the start, I think it's a really good onboarding point for this kind of cloud-native journey. Because if you've got some stuff that's on-prem, maybe some stuff that's in the cloud, you can build a mesh in both. You can get those meshes talking to each other, and then they'll share service discovery. They'll do mutual TLS for you. No more direct connect. No more trying to VPN them together. You'll get like a layer 7 VPN. So a host header will be picked up. Istio will know it's in the other mesh. It'll do an MTLS from ingress point to egress point. It'll send it across. That takes configuration today. I, I have a blog coming out, not to, not to big myself up, but like that does take a lot of configuration. Companies in, this, in the space, in the ecosystem, like mine at Tetrate, are, are, are building you know, tools around this. Uh, let's even skip that. Uh, yep, you probably want Istio. It's the biggest. This is Linkerd. This is Buoyant's other service mesh called Conduit. Um, I'm biased, obviously. Uh, but if you want to go on the numbers, uh, Istio certainly is the biggest at the moment. Uh, the Google Trends, the blue line is actually service mesh interest. It probably has doubled, it's the scale, maybe even tripled. The scale just doesn't really show it. Istio is, is the red line. Um, there's a hype train. I hope you think the hype train is justified. Um, and Istio's got wide backing, so obviously Google's done a lot of the work. IBM is involved. Uh, the Envoy proxy comes from Lyft. Um, a guy called Matt Klein, who's actually, uh, Envoy is written in C++, which is a completely separate talk, but Matt, Matt is like always up on stage saying C++ is a totally viable language in 2018. Um, so, yeah, go see him, and then you can throw tomatoes, too. Uh, and other people are involved. Uh, it's quite easy to deploy and use. I just showed it on GKE. Pretty super simple, to be honest. Um, integrates with Kubernetes, so all the, all the tools you know how to use are there. It's harder on Amazon's EKS. I have a blog. Go Google for it. It's just like a whole bunch of workarounds you have to, you have to do. And I confess I haven't tried it on Azure. Um, but you know you're going to be able to rent it soon, right? You know that control plane that I just installed, you know that's going to be managed soon on these major cloud providers, so it should get even easier. So I would encourage you to go home and try it, because I think you do need a service mesh. So I've talked too much. Thanks.